The broadcast is now starting. All attendees are in listen-only mode. Good afternoon, everybody, and welcome to this webinar on the UK student recruitment trends for 2019 from Olio and Universum. We're delighted today to be joined by Nikki Weaver, our student recruitment lead here at Olio, and Klaus Perron, the managing director of Nordics in UK for Universum, who will um, quickly introduce themselves. Hello, so good morning everybody. Um, yes, I'm Nikki Weaver. Um, I have a focus on new business development in the emerging talent space. I've been with Olio now six months. Um, in a previous life, um, I was a sales manager recruiting for a sales team, so I really do appreciate the challenges that you face as a recruiter. Um, I will now hand you over to Klaus um, to let him introduce himself. Well, thank you, Nikki. Uh, so my name is Klaus. Um, see that fantastic photo of my myself very glittery um, uh, I'm showing off a bit here I'm Swedish um, I'm typically normally a very humble person uh, but, you know being Swedish we should be humble that picture certainly is not humble at all that's one it's a fun one um, I've been with Universal for the past um, nine years working in, a, in the field of employer branding and I've seen it grow in importance and I've seen companies struggle more and more in, in finding and attracting the right people for their future so I think this is a very interesting um, area and I look forward to speaking a little bit more about it. Thanks very much both. Um, it's a pleasure to have you here and we're really glad that you could spare the time. Um, we want to start off briefly by just introducing the two companies so that all the listeners can understand what we do. Um, just before I hand over to do that, just to let everybody know that this session is being recorded and we will share with you the full slide deck that has been explored so you can apply these trainings to your everyday business. There is a questions pane on the GoToWebinar console that you can ask any questions of. We do uh, encourage you to ask those questions so that you can be engaged in the trends that we're sharing with you today for your next campus recruiting season. And with that, let me hand you over to Nikki, who's going to introduce Olio. Thanks, Joe. All right, so, um... Olio, um, we were formerly, well, some of you may have known us as um, WCN. We changed our name to Olio last year. And um, Olio actually comes from a mid-century term, which means a diverse collection of things that together make something beautiful. So that's how we see ourselves, a diverse team of technology and talent acquisition professionals who've come together. And we believe that in order to keep a competitive edge, um, talent acquisition teams must have the freedom and the technology to find, engage, and hire diverse talent from anywhere. Um, our mission is to help you do that faster and more efficiently than ever before. So um, we have been going now for uh, over 23 years. We started out in the graduate and volume sectors and have been recognized by Gartner as um, best in class in terms of graduate recruitment functionality. Um, founded by our current CEO, Charles Hips, who is still very much a driving force in the business, his ambition is to make the world more equal and our clients more productive. As you, as you can see from the numbers here, 98% of our candidates positively rate the experience with Olio as good to, or excellent. Um, also in terms of speed and quality of hire, which we know is, is key, um, one of our retail clients is seeing three days from application to hire. I will talk a little bit more about how we achieve this later on, but um, for now I'm gonna hand you back to Klaus to introduce Universum. Thank you, Nikki. Um, and here it is. Uh, I won't spend too much time on, on, on talking about us, but Universum, uh, in, in, in short, what we do is we are a global um, insight-driven employer branding agency um, working with clients across the world, including the UK, on helping them um, uh, attract the right talent for their future. So we're very focused on research uh, and advisory consulting services, but also what we call activation. Uh, we've been doing this for the past 30 years and, and uh, we think it's great and we take this very seriously um, and we have fun while doing it. Um, I, w I thought I'd, I'd, I'd um, zoom out a little bit um, having the um, perspective that we have working in so many different countries. Uh, I thought it'd be interesting perhaps for the audience today to hear about some of the Sort of overarching trends that we see when it comes to um, what what talent is looking for 
and this applies very much to the UK as well. And when I say talent right now, we're talking about university uh, students. So the first one is, uh, sorry, I'm clicking one too many. I'll go back. Um, bear with me. There we go. So the first one is the reason why, and this perhaps is nothing new to, to uh, the experienced audience we have today. Uh, this is all about purpose. You've heard the word purpose being mentioned uh, for the past, I would say, six, seven years as, as young people have been climbing Moscow's hierarchy of needs and their options uh, have increased. They have more choices, more uh, employers to choose between. If I'm a lucky person to be in demand, then what I'm ultimately looking for is to match my, my own purpose with that of the companies. And that's what we see uh, a stronger focus on. So when we ask talent around the world, including the UK, what is important to you when choosing an employer, we see things that have to do with meaningful purpose definitely uh, increase. And the ability to make an impact is one of the key things there uh, in that. So when we look at what, what employers do then, is of course to try to position themselves around purpose or to develop, as they would say, a purpose-led EVP, uh, a very nerdy way of, of, of uh, saying a, a, an offering, an employer offering that is sort of focused around uh, the reason why they do what they do. But a purpose-led EVP, we see increase. And when we ask employers around the world what they focus on from an employer value um, proposition standpoint, you can see to the right of this slide, and in 2016, only 30% of some of the leading global employers said they, they included purpose. Fast forward to 2018, you see that it's almost half of them that do that. So of course, suddenly something that was meant to be differentiating potentially becomes something that, that uh, is very much like all the other guys. And you can see a perhaps a, a, a little bit of a fun example of that, that when you articulate purpose, Sometimes you do it in a very similar way, similar way like the others. So you see down there that many companies have, have, have been talking about making an impact, for instance. So I guess one of the um, little tips from, from me today is that if you want to focus on purpose um, to capture these needs of young talent, then try to do it in a slightly different way. Find your way of, of expressing that because it is important and it is growing in importance year on year. So that's the first sort of macro trend that I wanted to bring to you, the, the purpose and the reason why that's important and it's increasing in, in importance. The other thing um, is this one, you grow, we grow, meaning a focus on learning. Uh, there is a small little formula to, to the right of the screen, L is greater than or equal to C. That is pretty much what we see um, people in general having in mind right now that I want to find myself in a place where L as in learning is greater than C as in change. So I want to find myself in, a, in an environment at a company, at an employer, where I feel that I learn more every day than the change that goes on outside of my, of my company. And if I do that, I will stay and I will stay engaged. I will probably not leave after 12 months. I perhaps leave after 36 months instead because it's a key focus right now. We see that growing in importance when we, when we, when we measure and we track talent across the 40 markets where we do it, um, that uh, things that have to do with learning, professional learning and uh, training and development, having leaders who will support my development, um, creative and dynamic work environment, those kind of things are increasing in importance. So a clear career path is no longer uh, perhaps the, the, the most important thing but rather to offer an environment where people can learn continuously. And it's a hard thing to deal with, of course, from an employer standpoint, but it is a clear trend. Okay. Nikki, well, over to you. Thanks for that, Klaus. Um, Nikki, I mean, how does that relate to, um, you know, what, uh, what you find when you talk to um, graduate recruiters and, and their uh, goals? Yeah, so, um, you know, we're finding that with, um, customers or clients that are currently working with us, we, we do have um, intelligent um, solutions around attraction engagement. And what we're seeing is that 
the most successful content used is tied to learning and development. So with this trend in mind, I suspect that we're going to see more learning and development departments working with the talent acquisition teams moving forward. Um, Excellent. No, that's really good. Um, and actually ties in really nicely with the actual research that Early on Universe and put together. Um, and you can see on your screen, there's just a brief um, breakdown of, you know, how we actually came about finding the trends that we did and looking at almost 4 million applications to various different graduate programs in the UK from the OLEO side and uh, also taking on board research from Universum for close to 45,000 students um, across various different degrees in, in a, a number of universities. So um, without further ado, let's uh, move forward into the actual research and start with uh, a poll question for you. So you can see here that there's a headline, competition is stiffer, and a number, 250,000. And we're going to kick start with a poll just so you can try and uh, define what that uh, 250,000 might be. Uh, so just one second while we launch that. Okay, the poll is now open. You should be able to see the poll on your screen. We'll give you a little while to answer the question. Okay, great. I'm now going to share the results. And we can see that 30% uh, of you think it's the average number of students applying to a graduate role. 20% of you think it's the number of attendees at graduate events. But half of you, 50% of you say it's something else. So let's actually show you the answer. Bear with us one second. Okay. And you can see that the answer is So yes, so it's the average number of applications received by blue chip companies, and interestingly, fifty thousand of those are in retail engineering and the advertising space. However, 30% of applications are not submitted, and actually as few as 1% are actually accepting offers and being hired. And that's all due to graduates having far more cho choice um, due to stiffer competition. Um, Klaus, I know you have something to add to our findings here. I'm sure I do. Um, I'm, I'm just, uh, I just... Just want to make sure we see the screen. I think maybe Joe, we lost the screen there for a little bit. Oh, okay, oh, sorry. Just... There we go. Yes. Um, as far I mean, as far as competition goes, I think it's it's an interesting conversation to to have. Uh, we have it with, with many companies, and and all of you have heard about the war for talent, and you're probably tired of hearing that, etc. But it is, in fact, of course, if you're an IT grad today, or if you're, you know, if you happen to be a, a woman and you're studying engineering, and 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 you perhaps you're you're, you're or you're focusing on on AI or something, without a doubt, of course, the, you, you can choose between a, a, you know, all potential employers. Everybody wants you. Uh, but of course, let's look at some facts then to see whether whether in fact the competition is increasing. And the way we do that is to look at uh, the number of employers or companies that the students are considering working for. So in our in our research, we we provide them with a long list of, of relevant employers um, for their particular field of study. And then we're asking them to tell us whether they are aware of this company and whether they would consider working for it. They can choose as many as they want out of a list of about um, 150. Um, back in... Um, 
just trying to click here. Um, ah, there we have the number. So back in 2008, um, for uh, a student in the UK, um, as this is an average across all different fields of study, um, uh, he or she would select 13 employers that they were generally interested in, in, in working for, considering, you know, it's not a strong choice. It's not that you have that you're in love with that potential employer, but you're sort of generally interested. Yeah, maybe I could do that. You know, 13. Um, and then to be the final choice of the, those 13, of course, was, was a hard task um, back in 2008. If we move forward to 2017, so only two years ago, you can see that number increased to 21. So almost doubling. Um, and what happened, of course, between 2008 and 2017 here is, is social media. Social media has, of course, led to uh, anybody knowing much more about uh, different employers. Uh, back in 2008, and perhaps if you go back to 2000, then it was very, the communication was very much in the hands of, of, of the employer. We could dictate who should know about us and who shouldn't know about us. In 2017, thanks to social media, I know about all these different companies. I hear from my friends about their experiences, uh, etc. So I would not only know of them, but I would also have an opinion about them. Secondhand opinion very often, but I would have an opinion. So this whole thing leads to that I am considering working for more employees because I know my my um, uh, uh, that I'm that I'm relevant at more employers. And if we then go to 2019 um, or 2018, sorry that number has jumped to 29. So this is a, a number that we expect to increase. I had a sneak peek at the 2019 numbers that we get that we got yesterday uh, for the UK and it has in fact increased. I won't tell exactly how much, but it has increased again. So then you can, can imagine that what we're looking at here is a, is a person that is trying to figure out what their next, what their first employer very often should be graduating from, from university and they're sitting there choosing between not 13, but 29 different employers. It's a hard task and it's tough uh, on the students perhaps, but it's also hard for us as employers to be that final choice. And if you think about um, uh, the task for the students, you could almost uh, say that it's like walking into a, an American supermarket shopping for cereals. I don't know if anybody has ever done that. Uh, the first time I did it, I took a picture and it looks like this. Um, very, very uh, overwhelming, too many different choices. Um, I left the supermarket without any cereals whatsoever because I simply couldn't make up my mind. Um, so I think one little tip for um, any employer listening today is of course to try to think about how could we stand out? How, if you think about this analogy with a supermarket and the aisle here you see in front of you, how could we stand out from the shelf? So that the people who we really need to attract actually choose us over somebody else. And that's a key thing for employers today is differentiation. Differentiation for the right reasons. Differentiating on something that really is us. Okay, so um, what we can see here um, is the continuing trend in terms of um, that gender gaps are equalizing, um, but there are notable gaps, especially in STEM-based roles. So. Um, Klaus, back to you. Um, how do you think um, we will keep seeing this trend improving? Well, I, I think, um, well, hopefully uh, we will see more, more, um, more and more women uh, applying. I think we start to see that uh, as more, more women enroll into STEM programs, but I think it, the, it, it doesn't happen fast enough. Uh, I think there's, there's a huge appetite from the employer side uh, on, on STEM people, and of course many Many companies would like to have more more women, but I think one of the challenges that we see um, some employers having is perhaps a lack of understanding on how to uh, communicate with these different target groups. Yes, you may say that the roles are the same, so we should uh, communicate in the same way. But if you only knew a little bit about what really drives women versus men, um, then perhaps you'd be more efficient. And, and looking into that, then what are the things that we see? are more attractive to women. And here we have two different groups. One is women in business and one is women in STEM. So if you start by women in business, <coughs> <coughs> now the things where um, 
And this is based on 40 different reasons for choosing an employer over another. And here we, we've selected five um, um, what we call attributes where that are more attractive to women in business. And you see ethical standards being significantly more attractive to, to women than to men. Perhaps that's a given. Flexible working conditions, good reference for future careers, corporate social responsibility, CSR is, is definitely more attractive. And then here comes the purpose, which is in this case um, then more important to women than to men. Um, so simply by knowing that, uh, uh, and uh, I could then tweak my messaging. Uh, I don't need to change everything, but I could apply um, my communication so that it speaks to uh, women uh, in a better way than today, perhaps, by introducing some of these things that you see here on the list. And as far as the women in STEM goes down to the right-hand side of the slide, you can see that support for gender equality is one that, that attracts them because they hear, obviously, uh, if I'm a, a woman in, uh, in STEM and I'm going into male-dominated uh, workplace, then really what I'm looking for there is, is that. As a man, I don't really need to think about that. Um, ethical standards, you see that here as well. You see inspiring purpose coming back here is more important for women. But also variety of assignments, uh, which is significantly more important to women than to men. Good, in, good insight, I think. And then the reference for future career. The whole the reference for future career thing uh, is one that is always important. And why is that important? Um, it's important both for men and women. It's simply because what these young people are, are thinking about is their long-term employability. They're not looking at this first employer being their lifelong employer, of course, we all know that. But they're really thinking about what does it matter? Um, how does it affect my, my ability to get the next job if I, if I choose this employer over this one? Is this one better than this one for my long-term employability? So that's what they're thinking, reference for future career. What does it mean if I stick this into my LinkedIn profile versus this company and this role versus this role, etc.? But that's important. So think about um, targeted communication. Think about how you can tweak things when you're addressing women, etc., without it being too obvious. Uh, don't make it too obvious that you're addressing just women, but you know, tweak the... Um, the, the, the communication is what I'm saying. Okay, so Brexit effects. Um, Joe, you can to run a poll. So um, in terms of um, the question is, did Brexit affect numbers applying from the EU and beyond to join a UK-based graduate program? Yep, we will launch that poll. Um, bear with me. Um, that will be the question that's asked. So, the poll is now launched, and you can see you're asking, for graduate schemes starting in 2018, did Brexit have a significant effect on global interest? A simple yes or no answer, we'll give you a few seconds. Okay, we're going to close the poll and you can see the results. 75% of you say yes and 25% of you said no. So interestingly, let's show you what the actual slide says. Okay. Okay, so yes, they did fall, but by only 5% um, compared to 2017. But hired numbers actually stayed steady, remained steady. And 15% um, of hires are from EU countries. And um, the top five countries um, for success were the same countries as last year, but in slightly a different order, as Eric Morecambe would say from Morecambe and Wise. I don't know if any of you remember Morecambe and Wise. Um, but yes, um, the same top five are there, but just in a different order. Klaus, what did your findings suggest? Well, we looked at um, the difference between international students uh, and, and UK students um, to compare um, a few different things. And, and here you have them next to each other. To the left, you have UK students, and to the right, you have the other nationalities. And I think what's, you know, salary expectations may not be the most relevant. We can see, of course, that uh, the 
the other national nationalities, the ones that are actually, you know, they, they've gone to the UK to study, uh, they may be more ambitious, maybe they also think they should have a little bit more money, or maybe they're just more in debt than, than, than the UK students, who knows, at least they're asking for more money, or they're hoping for more money. But it's more interesting perhaps to look at the, the top career goals. Um, so what um, the UK students across the board then, including everybody here, um, their, their number one top career goals, and that's a long-term uh, ambition, is work-life balance. That's the same almost in any country we go to. Work-life balance it does not mean that people are lazy. It means that they are, they've understood that that's something that we can expect. Um, so don't pay too much attention to that. But number two, number Number three, perhaps, are more interesting to look at. And while the UK students are, are busy thinking about a long-term long -term security and stability in my job uh, and dedication to a cause, so back to the, the purpose, the, uh, the international students here uh, are looking for companies that can offer an international career uh, and also one where they can be competitively or intellectually challenged. Uh, and if you then compare the industries uh, between the two groups, you can also see that, that the um, international students in this case are looking for industries perhaps more traditionally uh, career-oriented um, industries such as management and strategy consulting, banks, etc. while the UK students are looking for um, public sector, healthcare, care services, and educational and scientific institutions. Now remember that this is all students, not business engineering alone, etc. It's all students. Uh, but it's an interesting comparison, I think. And uh, you may then wonder, uh, is there a difference between the, the type of employers and the actual employers that they are, are attracted uh, to? What are their ideal employers? Who would they most like to work for? And uh, the British students then have uh, very much in line with the industries they were interested in. They, are, they want to join B, the BBC, NHS. Um, you see Google, the S popping up there, but apart from that, it's, it's civil service and et cetera. Uh, while the international students are looking for the big global employers, but NHS is there as well, thank God. Uh, <laughs> but it's the Googles and the Apples and the Facebooks and the Microsofts of the world that they're looking for. Um, so for anybody looking for international students representing one of these leading um, employers, you have a good bunch of international students that are ready to work for you um, and who seem quite ambitious. Nikki, over to you. Thank you. So <coughs> a new question from uh, Universum this year relates to where candidates hear about graduate programs. So we were keen to see which sources led to candidates deciding to apply and found that these were the top five. Um, our findings reveal that importance of digital engagement as well as dedicated camp campus events are key. Um, so I'm gonna pass you back to Klaus. Thank you. It's a nice little ping pong game that Nick and I are playing here, isn't it? You were you know, sharing the whole presentation. But here is um, the, um, some, some results from the, from the study we did uh, and, and that we do annually in, in the UK, where we look at the channels, not the channels that they use on, uh, in general, um, but the channels that the students use to interact with employers. That's important. And if we were, if we would have looked at this, um, let's say 10 years ago, then we would have seen a lot of print uh, on, on the slide, we would have seen a lot of uh, in-person and very little digital. So the green things are, are digital channels and the orange ones are, are print. But as you can see now, it, it's, it's, a lot, it's a lot of green and there's some blue here, which is in-person. So social media um, uh, and, and uh, online job boards, uh, career guidance websites, those are the kind of things where uh, that, that uh, students are using to interact with employers. But also, important to say, career fairs. Um, they also think that lectures and case uh, studies as part of the curriculum uh, is an interesting thing. And, and, and in general, um, a good mix between digital and in-person, I think, is the best advice we can give today. And, and the, when employer website uh, appears as number one in, in STEM, that's all good. And of course, you should have a really, uh, a really great career page uh, and a great uh, site. But don't forget, of course, that you need to drive traffic to that site. So 
really solid site, uh, good landing pages, um, and some strong social media presence combined with, with some in-person meetings so that they really can get to know you um, and see who you really are. That's uh, a good mix from a channel perspective. Uh, and when you and when you think about uh, social media, which I then say is is probably the key thing today, uh, that it's always interesting to see who are the most popular employers on social media. And we ask that the question to the students, and then they mention different employers, and then we create a word cloud. Um, and the first word cloud you will see here is business students, and here you can see that the ones that seem to really um, make an impact and have a strong presence in social media and that goes to Facebook, Instagram, uh, YouTube uh, and a few other channels, predominantly Facebook and Instagram and, and a bit of LinkedIn. LinkedIn is not as important in, in the student population of course. The companies that you see pop here are, are um, PwC, Deloitte, KPMG, um, JP Morgan, Google, some really strong um, employers that we know are really good at. Uh, Online. But you also see Aldi here, you see Unilever uh, and a number of others. If you can see yourself here, congratulations, then you've certainly made a presence. For somebody to be top of mind, because this is top of mind of the students, is already an achievement in itself. So that's the business students. If we then look at the STEM students, this is what it looks like. Um, Google pops uh, here, uh, but also Rolls-Royce. Great, seems to have a great presence in the UK, doing lots of good stuff. Um, but also Jaguar, Land Rover, Arup, um, Microsoft, BAE Systems. There's a good mix here of different uh, employers. And, and this is important, of course, because being present on, on, um, in social and making a positive impact in social means, of course, that you are an, you're a responsive employee, you are a modern employer, etc. And these companies that you see here popping out are companies that, in, that spend a lot of time and invest a lot of money into social media and to being active and, and present there. Here's an example from PwC that you saw pop in. Uh, it's one of the most popular ones in, uh, according to the business students. Here's taken from their Instagram page. <clears throat> a lot of real people, some of the real employees um, coming uh, out here very clearly in their Instagram page and also brought in uh, Rolls Royce. Uh, where they mix images of their cool products with, with some real people um, and a good variety of people, I would say, as well. Very, in a subtle way, uh, showing great diversity here at, at Rolls-Royce. Mixed up with these cool engines that uh, a lot of people really want to get their hands on, I guess. Um, and predominantly in social media uh, of all these different channels, um, Facebook is still dominating. Um, you see that uh, the STEM people in the black bar here are uh, seem to be more active on, on Facebook, um, followed by LinkedIn. And then Instagram is, is more uh, popular among the business students together with Twitter. YouTube, there's a bit of a uh, fo uh, stronger focus there among the, the STEMs and I think that's probably enough to mention, but you can see how Facebook dominates here. So if you do a combination of Facebook and Instagram with the same platform, then you're probably well off, I would say. If you're if you're sitting listening today and say, oh, we haven't really started, or we know we're just in our early steps when it comes to social media, then then you know Facebook and Instagram is your best bet. But it's a very crowded world out there, so you really need to think about the type of content you put out there and to be authentic. Um, thank you, Klaus. So, uh, um, yes. Okay, so no one listening today is going to be surprised about this topic, um, the importance of candidate experience. So 98.4% um, of candidates who submitted through our technology rated the experience as either good or excellent. We know where that uh, 1.6 um, those people live, um, so I'll be in touch with them. But so going back to the 98.4% of applicants who've had a good experience with us, this has been really due to the ease and speed of using our platform, um, together with the ability to provide engaging and relevant content, which can actually be delivered at different points throughout the whole recruitment process, um, whilst also providing the ability to capture immediate online feedback. Um, so that's key to 
obviously recruiters and their brand understanding what's attracting candidates to them and obviously the experience they're having with their, your organization. So as we know, the new generation of candidates coming through are used to using mobile devices to access information and make applications on the fly. So speed and quality of engagement is key. Um, one of our clients, Marks & Spencer, have um, adopted with us a two-touch process. So what that means is that from vacancy, screening is automated up to the interview stage. So Marks & Spencer's actually provide a realistic job preview. So that's the video which explains the day in the life of say a customer service assistant. And if the candidate's interested, they can then complete an online screening application form which our solution will then automatically select those which should go through to the next step of the process based on Marks and Spencer's criteria. Um, they also then undertake a situational judgment test and if they pass that, they get to actually meet a real person um, for an interview. So um, what we've seen is that Marks and Spencer um, is actually from application to interviews, um, it's taking 35 minutes, from application to hire, three days, and from application to rehire in just five minutes using our technology. So just to put it into context, candidates will have actually started at Marks & Spencer's before they are even interviewed by their competitors. And we've seen that the business impact has um, been estimated to be worth about 377 million in earned revenue for Marks & Spencer's due to the fact that on average, they are filling roles 26 days faster than their competitors. You know, I appreciate that this is uh, not uh, one model fits all, but it just provides an illustration of what can be achieved. Um, and candidate experience, as already mentioned, has been hugely positive. Um, so what additional information, um, Klaus, have you found around this? Well, first of all, I must say, I, I'm, <clears throat> I'm, I was very surprised when I saw this number. You, you and I, of course, discussed this before, um, but, but, but the 19.4, percent of um, applicants that are either uh, see the, the process as excellent or very good. I mean, that's extreme. That's very, very high. And, and I think the, the, the speed uh, of the process that you describe is, of course, right. It fits exactly with what the target group is looking for. And, and as you said, they're very used to a speedy process and an immediate um, feedback um, using other devices, use, using other applications in, in their normal life. I think this very much matches the needs of this this um, this generation. Um, and let me move over to um, this one, where where we talk about a uh, question that we asked in the survey um, to a number of different groups. You see the different bars. It's a bit a bit of a busy slide, but the different bars uh, represent people that are interested in apprenticeships. That's the brown bar. The blue bar is interested in internship interested in a, in a graduate scheme is the red one and yellow is interested in a permanent position and and you see at the top uh, we asked the question what would make the application process more interesting for them than ease and short application process is really what they're looking for so if we have an a, a, an ats that is somewhat um, outdated perhaps and offers a user experience which is far from the one that we want and it takes way too long and we also wait in coming back and there's no opportunity to give feedback etc then you know we are actually shooting ourselves in the foot and and we're giving away candidates to our competitors uh, without that because it's very clear that what they're looking for is ease and, and immediate feedback uh, online when applied perhaps we can think that they're asking for too much uh, but i think we just need to adapt um, in my world it's very clear when we ask them Okay, thank you. So uh, you. in terms of this slide, um, as you can see here, there are still gaps in race equality. Um, just under 6% of all hires are black candidates. Um, what perhaps is quite interesting is the number of candidates choosing to not disclose their um, ethnic origin, um, and that has actually increased. Um, Klaus, has this been reflected in your findings at all? Yeah, we looked at... Um... The, the one word uh, that students associate with their ideal employers and, and uh, diversity actually <clears throat> popped up there for the very first time. And here's another word cloud then for you. And you will see here that even though it's perhaps not the, the, the most mentioned word, it certainly 
uh, is there. You can see that in, in, two, in two places mentioned by, by several hundreds of, of students that diverse is the key thing that they associated with one of their favorite employers, one of their ideal employers. So it certainly is, is something that we should be focusing on. And I know I'm kicking an open door with, with a lot of initiatives going on in, in uh, different employers, but it's, some, it's an area that students seem to be paying more attention to in, than in the past. And there's some employers that, that I would say do this well in a very natural way. And um, I just grabbed a screen grab from PwC. We're not promoting PwC, but we knowing that they are a very popular employer um, in the UK and a leading employer in the UK, they also do a lot of a lot of things right. And here's a good example of that in terms of, of um, showing diversity without sort of mentioning it at all. It's just showing some really solid, really good employees um, working for PwC. And here you go, a good mix. Over to you, Nick, again. Thank you. So we are now um, at the last of our early findings topics and one that I personally think we need to work on um, really to help the drive towards an increased diversity in the workplace. So only a third of successful hires are coming from outside of the 24 Russell Group universities. Um, Olio analysis found that employers are still heavily leaning towards Russell Group universities with only a third of successful hires coming from outside of that group, as I said, and um, you know, just um, it, Klaus, back to you. If you want to even up the balance, how might our friends achieve this? Well, I think I think there are certain things that 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 um, uh, could be done in terms of of because uh, uh, I think we're we're losing out on a number of, of talent. I think uh, AI, uh, artificial intelligence, has a role to play here. Machine learning has a role to play here. Um, test uh, more automated tests um, early on in the recruitment process to really make it as non-biased as possible. Because certainly among the, the, the non-Russell uh, students, there are some, some great uh, talent as well. And not everybody needs the, the, the very top talent, the very demanding top talent. Some are very, uh, opting for, uh, we find that uh, we want people that really match our values, um, our behaviors, et cetera. And that's much more important than coming from the right university. So more, um, higher for attitude, train for skills is what we see. And, but let's look at a bit um, about um, these two groups. And if, if you compare the, the Russell Group University students <coughs> with the non-Russell Group students, um, red being Russell, blue being non-Russell, yes, um, you can see that um, in general, the Russell Group are somewhat more what we would call high achievers, perhaps. Um, they, they are less interested in work-life balance than the non-Russell Group University, whether that's good or bad, you can debate. Um, um, the, the Russell Group students are, are less um, uh, focused on security and stability and more on uh, finding themselves uh, in a competitively intellectually challenging environment and to have an international career. Um, but this is, again, an average uh, key thing here being to make sure you have recruitment processes that allow, that allow for you to, to uh, open up the talent pool, which would, in, which would then include also non-Russell uh, students, because amongst those, of course, you would find some really well-suited candidates, perhaps even better suited than at, at Russell. But how you do that, I'll leave to Nikki to explain. Um, well, we can see. Sorry, I, I had one. I had one. Yeah, sorry. I, 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 that was my fault. Um, I had I had one more here. Just very quickly on on the employers they're interested in, and, and you can see a bit of a difference here between the non Russells and the and the Russells, uh, non Russells to the right, um, but quite similar employers that they're attracted to. So no major difference here, um, and of course. For all these employers, if they could, if they could be a little bit um, wider in their approach to talent, of course, it would it would allow for for more of the right applicants eventually applying for them. Okay, well, thank you so much, both, because those are the seven key trends within the actual research itself. Um, like I mentioned at the start of the webinar, we really do encourage your questions. So, if you think any of those trends. Um, deserve to be explored more or you want some clarity, please do feel free to raise your questions uh, and we'll get to those 
towards the end of the webinar. Um, you know, briefly, what we want to do now is just talk to you about actually addressing those trends and, and looking at ways of transforming your student hiring um, with technology. Okay, thank you. So, um, as we know, technology has huge benefits in terms of, um, especially in early careers and student recruitment, we're seeing that more and more. Um, all of us are presently using machine le learning in our everyday lives, so Amazon provides prompts on products um, we may have been interested in based on our previous purchase history. The same applies with Netflix, recommending movies that we um, wish to see based on what we've watched before. So our world is constantly changing, as we all know, due to technology. So um, machine learning, artificial intelligence um, can transform your student hiring for five key reasons, as you can see here. So um, it can enable you to fill hard to fill roles by widening your talent pools. Um, you can also use technology to reduce bias and improve um, diverse hiring. And I'll go into that in a little bit more detail later. Um, you can hire the best through efficiencies before your competitors do. I mentioned the Marks and Spencer's uh, case. And of course, you can cut costs and let recruiters spend the time what they love to do best. Um, which is engaging with candidates and um, getting them hired. So um, the other thing is um, we're seeing through technology that you can increase um, high retention, better job performance, and also enables you to identify more future leaders. So um, it's simple to use. So our machine learning algorithms can look at your existing best hires, your existing employees, and start to learn what to look for in new candidates coming through your recruitment process. So. We can actually provide you with visibility of future star candidates in the way shown here. And how we do this is we look at um, your existing data framework. So um, we can actually um, start with your, um, for example, tests, video scores, CVs, as you can see here. And um, our intelligent automation and or prescriptive recommendations can support you in your decision making process. So. You know, simply predicting that a person is a good fit can be very costly, as you know. Um, recruiters um, focused on high quality outcomes need to know who is most likely to accept an offer, but also know who's most likely to stay with the team long enough to make a real impact. Um, our prescriptive recommendations helps you to make better informed decisions in a fraction of the time. And this is powered by um, 120 data points, um, which can include work experience, education standardized tests and also it can look at um, performance in in the job so as i'm sure you um, may have seen yourselves sometimes recruiters and hr teams can act in silos so once a candidate has been employed hr take over the process and the recruiters therefore get very little visibility in regard to retention and performance so we can actually encapsulate that information and provide you with the visibility um, as also, um, we know that the future is diverse. We've all read the stats and data. So a drop in supply has actually caused employers to seek untapped talent pools. For example, in Europe, we see a shift from university to school recruitment. In the UK, more than 50% of employers have introduced apprenticeship schemes um, just in the last few years. So more generally, the future is diverse because diverse teams are more productive. So. One of them, well, Marks and Spencers have managed to increase diversity by 48% through the use of our intelligent automated selection, which I described earlier, um, whilst also improving quality by 5 to 16%. Um, so we have been working with a world leading science team at UCL, together with our own internal data scientists, to develop new techniques to remove, to remove really bias from decision making. So blind screening is what we can provide as part of the solution. And um, there are, you know, some insights, some of the insights that we've had revealed by existing client base. Um, so some of have, um, have been running our machine learning um, data analysis alongside their usual recruitment process to support them and provide insight um, during the early careers recruitment process. And um, just to give you an example, one of our clients, the Met Police, 35,000 police officers, have almost doubled the percentage of female candidates by providing inspiring content to assure female candidates that they actually have a place, there's a place for them within the Met Police. And what our technology did was it was revealed that female candidates were actually dropping out just prior to the physical assessment part of the recruitment process. So by using content from their own um, internal diverse role model, and in this case, it was a black female employee, 
um, who provided a realistic preview. So a video explaining that there was um, nothing to be concerned about in terms of the physical assessment, what they would expect. And hey, I did it and I've never looked back. So it just inspired female candidates to progress through the process. Brilliant. And um, uh, Claude, how does that sort of um, fit into what you're finding at Universum um, for addressing the concerns raised in the, uh, the report that we put together? No, I think that I think that's um, a very modern and smart usage of technology, and and it's ultimately helps society as well. I mean, I think we're it's it's uh, an, an employer is to really tap into to the entire uh, pool of talent. Um, so I think the way the usage of AI and machine learning was described now by Nikki, I think it's it's a brilliant. Um, approach to it um, of course as, as employers we, we should know who we who, who what, what defines talent for us you know what we're looking for but in the past I think that that talent definition has been very much made up of, of which university do they go to what are, what exactly have they studied potentially what sort of internships have they had etc and what are their grades um, I'm exaggerating a bit but that's been the sort of historical talent definition uh what but and, and that's very much the rational part of it and that probably should be to great to a certain degree part of still of the definition but what we need to add is stuff like um personality uh what are the drivers what are the values what's the purpose i think some of those things are going to be significantly more important than which university you go to for instance uh, we see companies like ikea i come from sweden so ikea is always my best example an entirely value-driven co company that clearly says that we it's at, at IKEA, it's always going to be values over CVs, meaning that if you don't if you don't pass their value test, it doesn't matter if you uh, have a great degree from from Oxford or, or Cambridge, you're still not going to be employed by IKEA, uh, because in the long run, that's more important for them. So my, that's a long answer to to a short question. Sorry, uh, Joe, but but I think this is absolutely what's needed for the future to increase diversity. Uh, to help employers find the people that they really need, regardless of where they've gone to school, what they look like, etc. No, that's great. Thank you, Claude. And um, I think it shares with some of the questions that our uh, audience have asked. We've, we've only got eight minutes left live, so we're just going to squeeze in uh, one or two questions quickly, um, and then we'll come back to everybody else who asked questions via email at the end of this broadcast. Um, so maybe if I start with you, Nikki, I, I, there's a question around, you know, how much this really relates to the discussions that you have day to day with uh, resourcing leaders and, and the challenges they're having in finding great student talent right now. Yeah, so um, there's still a lot of organisations there um, that have a manual process. Uh, CV screening um, can be part of that and it's just removing um, the unconscious bias elements. Um, I think with the number of applications that are coming through, there's also a challenge in terms of how do they find those staff candidates quickly before their competitors do. Um, and the other is engaging. So we've, you know, um, as Klaus was mentioning earlier, and sorry, Klaus, I kept, kept saying Klaus, so I do apologize for my pronunciation, but um, it's, it's actually engaging and keeping um, those, those um, candidates um, engage within the organization. I mean, I've, I've actually spoken to graduates where they have found that actually it's taking, um, they sometimes may have got through to an interview and they don't hear, st surprisingly still to this day, several months later. And of course, they've moved on and, and joined another competitor by that point. Um, so really, um, just from my experience, I've been engaging with uh, recruiters, employers, um, really understanding their process and how we can help automate some of that um, and increase efficiencies as a result because there's a lot that's still done manually that takes up a lot of time and distracts the recruiter from what they really need to do. Um, so yeah, sorry, I hope that answered the question. Yeah, of course, sure, thanks. Uh, and Charles, on similar lines, there's a question around, you know, what really makes a good EVP stand out for, for students in particular because they are, you know, a change in demographic. Yeah, I think, yeah, uh, there's not one simple answer to it, but the, what you really need to look at, of course, when you develop an EVP um, is, 
you know what what's what's true uh, what are we what's the current reality at, at our company what 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 are the strong points of our um, that our employees agree on that's one aspect the other aspect is of course what is attractive to the target group uh, in this case the students and the third part is you know where where are we going as a company where are we heading what's the management's view uh, as a company if you combine those three perspectives you will find that certain things correlate to the certain things that are true in all three areas and that's that's the starting point for for your evp development and then when when crafting an evp that will help you stand out and be a very clear choice and, uh, and an employer that the right people will fall in love with uh, that requires a lot of work to really differentiate a lot of bench um marking against competitors to make sure you don't say the same things as the others etc not focusing on the same things but that's really how you do it to bring in all those three perspectives and then really try to tweak it and tweak it and tweak it until you find something ah here is something that is truly us and it's very differentiating um and it goes by um you know communication and it goes by our words but also through videos and having the right employees do the talking for us as an employer to really resonate with the with the, with the target audience Perfect. Thank you. Because the benefit today of the yeah the benefit today of social media is of course that 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 if we have made up our minds of who we're really looking for the people that we really really fit uh, at our company we can find them um, we can approach them through social media etc. That that is the opportunity today that we never had before. Excellent. Well, that really does help to wrap up. It's been a great food for thought webinar. We really hope you take things away from this and we will as we said send out the slides so you can refer to them at any point in your campus recruiting planning uh, you know one call to action that we really want to leave you with is as nikki mentioned earlier it's really important to us at olio and also to universum that recruiters feel like they can unleash potential so you know we'd encourage you to think about what's being shared and if you'd like to schedule a meeting with our team and we'll walk you through it uh, on both sides. Uh, happy for you to come back to us with your feedback on this webinar as well. So with that, we just want to say a big thank you. My personal thanks to Nikki and Klaus for uh, spending the time today and, and joining us. The guide itself is on the handout section of this webinar and we can send it to you electronically as well if you'd like a copy. Um, we do encourage you to read it. It's got lots of meat in there, which will really help you to structure your thinking around student recruitment trends for the UK. Uh, and with that, we say goodbye and thank you very much. Thank you. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye.